Mining is at the heart and heritage that makes northeastern Minnesota what it is today. A health economy has been linked to a healthy lifestyle, and mining jobs provide living wages that support families, strengthen economies, and build communities. The range is on the threshold of a new era of mining, copper-nickel mining, one that could build on our rich heritage. This mining will safely produce metals that are essential to our modern lifestyle while minimizing impacts to the environment. Can we mine these important metals, create good-paying jobs, and protect the environment? Jessica Stauber talks with Brad Moore, Executive Vice President of Environment and Government Affairs for Polymet Mining. Greetings, I'm Jessica Stauber. As a former television news anchor and reporter, I'm an inquisitive person who seeks to fully understand the stories I report on. Polymet Mining, in its quest to become the first company to mine copper, nickel, and other precious metals on the Iron Range, is certainly a big story with many layers. I'm thrilled to be joined by Brad Moore, Executive Vice President for Environmental and Governmental Affairs at Polymet Mining. Welcome. Pleasure to be here. Well, we have the next hour to talk through the project, so we'll really be able to dig in to understand the what Polymet is trying to do, why, where, and how. So let's get started. Now, you've been with Polymet since 2011. Tell us what you did prior to joining the company. Prior to Polymet, I was uh, working for a consulting company, Bar Engineering, and there I worked in terms of government relations, work for large industrial projects. But most of my career has actually spent, been spent on regulation. I spent about 18 years with the Department of Natural Resources and a few more at the Pollution Control Agency working on environmental regulation for a variety of industries, from agriculture, forest products, and even mining. So really a broad background in, in natural resources. What made you decide to join the Polymet Project? You know, I grew up actually in um, Duluth, Minnesota. I was actually born on the Iron Range. And one of the things that's always struck me is that I wanted to work hard to bring back something, give back to the communities where I came from. Polymet it presented itself an opportunity to use my regulatory expertise to help diversify and strengthen the economy here in northern Minnesota. Thank you. Well, Polymet is a publicly traded company on both the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange. And the Polymet's project is all on, uh, the focus is all on this one project, the North Met Project. So we'll start now by giving us an overview of what the North Met Project is. So the North Met Project is a proposed open pit mine. And the minerals that we want to mine are copper, nickel, cobalt, and the platinum metal group, including gold. And the mine is typical in the sense that it's an open pit proposed operation much like you see taconite. The um, pit tends to be a little bit deeper, but in size comparison, it's sometimes a half or even a third the size of the existing taconite operations. So it's an operation where you blast rock, crush it, and then process it. Um, in that regard, it's similar. Where it's different is that what traditional mining in northern Minnesota has been for iron and taconite, these are for copper, nickel, which are actually are form in a different manner in the rock. Now let's take a look at an overview of the project to, to orient ourselves to, to where the site is and what uh, existing infrastructure is already at the site, which really makes it a unique project in that regard. Sure. So first of all, in terms of when you look at the site, there's several things to consider. First, we're about 175 miles from Lake Superior in the Lake Superior watershed in the upper St. Louis River Basin. Just to the north of us, um, there's um, the Rainy River Basin, which flows to the Boundary Waters Wilderness in Quetico. So our water flows south towards Duluth. For that project, we actually have to meet standards at that particular project boundary. Now, when you, when you dial it down to the actual site where the proposed mine is, several things to consider. First of all, an aerial shot shows that the North Shore Taconite operation, which is running today, is just over a mile north of where a proposed mine site is. We also have the existing LTV processing facility. That was a taconite operation where the, it was processed and was closed in 2001. What we want to do is refurbish and reuse that existing facility. In addition, reviews, reuse the existing four square mile tailings basin. So a great deal of this project is about reuse and getting an existing facility up and running. Now for that proposed mine site, which is about seven miles east of the facility, we already have road and power and rail right to that mine site. So what makes this project particularly strong is the existing infrastructure. In addition, if you visit the site, uh, there's lots of mining features in terms of when LTV was there, 
North Shore, Masabi Nugget. It's an area where there's been a lot of mining and not a lot of tourism or high amenity lakes where you see like lake homes. So in terms of it's right in the heart of, of um, Iron Range mining. Now you alluded to this, but I've heard you actually use the phrase before. Uh, this is one of the largest recycling projects in the world. I love that expression. Well, when you go to our concentrator building, it's a third of a mile long. And you look at the, you know, the American know-how that built that in the 1950s. And for us to have an opportunity to upgrade it to modern standards in terms of environmental performance, worker safety, and also production, it's, it's just a tremendous opportunity for Northern Minnesota. It certainly is. Now, where is the project uh, in, the, in the environmental permitting process? Talk, talk us through where you've been and, and what's next. Sure. Well, I think the things to think about in environmental review is you have two main parts. You have to do what's called an environmental impact statement, and that's the effort we're in right now. And the second is permitting. So an environmental impact statement is basically a very large information document that describes every aspect of the project that you can think of in terms of what does the project look like? What are its potential impacts on the environment? How are those impacts mitigated or avoided? And that includes everything from mining to endangered species, to air, to water, to even cultural resources. Now for a document of this size, it's in the thousands of pages, there are many regulatory agencies that oversee it. In our particular case, the environmental impact statement is led by the US Forest Service on the federal side and the Army Corps of Engineers. Forest Service is responsible for the land ownership, whereas we have the mineral ownership underneath. The Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for the permitting for the wetlands that we take during the mining operations and of course have to replace. On the state side, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has a permit called the Permit to Mine and that's the details in terms of how do you begin mining and year-to-year -year activities and reclamation and important aspects such as financial assurance. In addition to this, the environmental impact statement includes the three northern Minnesota bands, Fond du Lac, Boys Fort, and Grand Portage as cooperators because they have their treaty rights under the 1854 treaty. So they're involved as well. And finally, the national, uh, the, the, the top regulatory agency for air and water is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. They're actually a cooperator as well on this EIS document. So you see there's a variety of federal and state regulators, all whose job is to make sure we meet all those standards and protect our land, water, and air. So we're at in terms of the process is, we're nearing the stages where a final EIS will be coming out later this spring or summer. And when that final EIS comes out, it's the definitive document, again, that describes the document, excuse me, describes the project. Think of it as a large information document that then those that actually write the water and air and permit to mine use as the basis for information on the permit. And I think key on permits in terms of people to understand the differences, think about a mill site when you have a large concentrator building. That permit includes very specific provisions for every air emission stack, every discharge of water. How do you handle waste materials? So think of it as many times more detailed than in that very broad environmental impact statement. We're moving into that permitting stage this summer. I think key to that in terms for listeners, you'll see more public meetings, public input, and discussion really over the remainder of 2015 into 2016 on permitting. So to call this process comprehensive might be a bit of an understatement. I mean, a thousand, thousands of pages in documentation, so many agencies involved. It's, it's really comprehensive. Why does it have to be so comprehensive? Well, these are very comprehensive projects. In fact, I believe this is going to be the, the longest in terms of most detailed environmental impact statement in Minnesota history. One of the reasons is that Minnesotans really care about their environment. They care about the air and their water, and they want to make sure we do things right. And hence, we have the layer of both federal and state regulators that want to make absolutely sure when we design it, it's done to the very best standards, not only here in Minnesota, but worldwide. That takes time to do well. It'll be time well spent. Now, the, the biggest discussion for this project centers on water and whether the North Met project can be completed without harming water quality. The short answer is? Yes. Now you've talked already about the agencies involved in the, in the documentation that must go into it to prove that the mine can operate while protecting the water. Um, 
let's let's talk now a little bit more about the watershed that it's in. You've hinted on this a little bit before, but let's take a look at the overview map that shows what watershed your project is in. Sure. So in looking at the map, what you'll see is uh, that the project is at the very headwaters of the St. Louis River. And by the way, if you think about Minnesota, every piece of land is in a watershed or a sub-watershed so that if we're not in the St. Louis River, we'd be in the Mississippi or the Rainy River to the north. So I think that's important to note that any project, whether it's manufacturing or mining, exists in one. Now that particular watershed, because we're at the top of it, um, we have about 175 river miles to Lake Superior. But nonetheless, we had to prove to state and federal regulators that our proposed project meets all standards rated our project boundaries. So it's not a matter where you discharge and worry down on Lake Superior. No, it's a matter where you absolutely meet those standards right at the site. And I can, I can give you three examples to drill down a little bit of what we mean by good water quality. In Minnesota, we have a very unique statute that protects wild rice. And wild rice is, there's a bit of a debate going on about it, but they, it's susceptible in certain cases to sulfate and sulfides. Sulfate, um, the drinking water standard is 250 milligrams per liter. Now, that might not have a meaning, except consider this. For wild rice, it's 10. So it's very, very pure water. In our particular tailings basin, the water has a sulfate level of around 60, which is more than the rice standard. So what we did is we worked on a design of that tailings basin and using water treatment so we can easily meet that 10 milligram standard and meet that state standard. Also with the EPA reviewing it, saying we can. So for example, if you look at this bottled water right here, um, this is actually, uh, sometimes bottled water has more sulfate in it than the wild rice standard. And how do we do that? What's the technology? It's called reverse osmosis. And basically, think of taking dirty water and pushing it with energy through a membrane and the dirt stays on one side and the clean water comes out. By the way, I point at this because this drinking water here was, was made through reverse osmosis. So it's a technology that's used, any of you that buy bottled water in a store, those of you that um, are drinking water in many municipalities in southern Minnesota, or you've seen recently some of the discussion on the drought in California, desalinization plants use reverse osmosis. So what we did is we took 3 million gallons of tailings basin water, ran it through the reverse osmosis system, not only for sulfate, but also for metals and other constituents, and proved to state and federal regulators that the actual water that we could do it. Now what's good about pilots like this is that then you take that data and you use it to actually design the full system. So we're using real data as opposed to you know, an experiment. So that's an example of one area of water quality. Let me give you a couple others. I talked a bit before about the tailings basin in terms of that it leaks. Tailings basins actually in the 1950s and 60s were designed to leak because rainwater would fall on these and you wouldn't want them to overtop. As our environmental laws have gotten stronger and we realize what's more in the constituents, in our particular case, we worked with regulators to say, you know, we can stop that leakage. And what we basically do is put a barrier between the tailings basin and the bedrock. And what happens is the barrier is made out of a clay substance called bentonite. And bentonite, when, it, when you add water to it, it forms, it's like a plastic, uh, it's, it's impervious to water. So that water that normally would flow out is stopped, collected, and then treated by the reverse osmosis system. And so all the water work has been done to prove that works. And in fact, uh, in another mine in the Midwest, in, in Michigan, they have the same kind of barrier in operation now with great success in terms of making sure water doesn't move across it. Let me give you another example in terms of water quality though. You know, mercury is a really important issue in northern Minnesota because many of our lakes are above standard in terms of fish that we eat has too much mercury in it. This of course largely occurs because mercury coming from the sky is airborne deposition from the air. Well our mercury discharges actually are many times cleaner than the mercury found in natural rainwater. And in addition to that, when you look at the natural runoff into the St. Louis River Basin from the land and rain, we're two to three times cleaner than the natural water there. So actually, in terms of our project on mercury, we don't have a net increase. 
So we end up with a net decrease in sulfate, no increase in mercury. The actual design of the mine site itself during operations is zero discharge. Plus we use proven wastewater treatment technologies that are used across the board, not only in Minnesota, but in the nation. And these different layers form a really solid regulatory basis for meeting standards. The other part is that that's not enough when you have a mining operation. What you have to do in addition to that is you have to monitor. So monitoring wells and monitoring points, both not only on the water, but the air, are placed all over the facility. And you know, I know MPCA regulations well, and the mo monitoring is continuous. And the point is that is so that regulators always can see in terms of to make sure those standards are being met. What do you mean the, the monitoring is continuous? Does, does there cameras or 24 sensors? hours a day, seven days a week. They have uh, various engineering um, methodologies where you have real-time data. And the beauty of it is if you have a situation where somewhere one of your uh, machines isn't working right and it, it looks like the water quality is starting to spike up in terms to a given constituent, still below standard, but you're like, hmm, it automatically shuts the system down. So you have a variety of controls and redundancy in the systems. Because really, if you think about it, who's most interested in keeping the water clean? We are. Because if you don't have that situation, you have two problems. First of all, your mill's not running, and you want it to run. Secondly, if you have regulators there suggest, you know, saying that you're not meeting the standards, no one wants to be in that situation in terms of a company. There's just a strong effort always with companies to have perfect compliance records. Well, some people still say, well, why not, why not mine elsewhere? There's water here, we're in watersheds. Uh, why, why not mine elsewhere? Get the metals somewhere else. What do you say to that? Several things. First of all is that the resource that we have in the Duluth complex, and that's the large area to the east of the Masabi Iron Range, is truly world-class in terms of, you know, in the very top tier in the world for these particular metals. Meaning, and, explain on that. That means that this is one of the largest deposits yes, in the world. And, it, and this complex is one of the largest in the world, and our North Met project is only one project within that vast complex. But there's more to it than that. First of all, if you think about our everyday lives, we use metals to turn on the lights, to drive our car. The catalytic converter that can cleans our air uses platinum. We use the metals everywhere, and there's really a responsibility to say, if we're going to use them, we also should be responsible in terms of where they come from. And Minnesota has the best regulations really worldwide. And so in that way, because we use them, we can responsibly also get them here. But it's more than just the responsibility part. There's also a strategic element. Right now, there's only one operating nickel mine in the US. Nickel is a critical element in terms of stainless steel and very important products related, for example, to defense. It's important for that we have a resource here as well, in addition to just importing. Then the other reason is this, jobs. If you look at the history we have in northern Minnesota of both tourism, jobs, wilderness, hunting, fishing, this is a way to, to developing copper nickel can further diversify the Iron Range economy so that we have strong taconite, strong copper nickel, strong tourism, health care, and diversification to make them more resilient communities. And we definitely want to be a part of that equation. And we can have both end, both safe mining and good environmental management. In fact, if you think about it, those of us involved in the industry, for example, in our company, they're users of the Boundary Waters wilderness, and they're fishing, and they're out hunting, and in my case, rising. Uh, it, it, this, is our, this is our home. Now, we use these metals in our everyday lives. Elaborate more on how these metals are used specifically in the clean energy sector. Well, as you know, there's just a huge push nationwide, and particularly in Minnesota, to move towards clean energy such as wind and photovoltaics. You know, a large wind turbine uses per megawatt 2,000 pounds of copper. And you look at photovoltaics, that actually uses more metal per megawatt than a wind tower uses per megawatt, and a wind tower uses more metal than you see, for example, in traditional such a coal-fired plant. So in order to move to the green economy in terms of harnessing the wind and being energy efficient, we actually mining is an integral part of it and necessary. Much like there's over 100 metals in your cell phone or the people watching this program, the electricity is moving through copper wires so you can actually 
listen to this dialogue. Despite all of this, some people still say, well, there's going to be acid rock drainage or toxic water. How do you, how can you dispel that even further? I mean, you're, you're proving that you can mine safely. Uh, what, else, what else can you tell people about it to sure. alleviate their fears? So if you look at the history of the mining industry in the United States, you know, there were a number of cases where we had acid rock, acid rock drainage mm -hmm. and real damage to streams in the environment. That's a history of this particular industry. What's happened though, a lot of those uh, operations, they began or they ran, even the LTV facility where we're gonna re, uh, reuse the facility, when that was built, there was no environmental protection agency. There was no pollution control agency. There was no Wetland Conservation Act. Things have changed a lot. But let's get more into the details on the water itself. So first of all, in terms of the way acid rock drainage comes about is important to know. So if you think about the copper nickel resource underground, it sits there, it's inert. There isn't any acid rock drainage. So how does it change? When you take that rock and blast it and move it, bring it to the surface, you expose it to oxygen. And if you have rain, the rain and the oxygen hit that the mineralization, which includes sulfate. And you can get a weak sulfuric acid. Now, a couple things about that that are important to note is that oftentimes you hear opposition say battery acid or sulfuric acid and they make it sound. It's actually the, the acidity in our rock is at the most that of beer. So it's not like the battery acid. Nonetheless, as much as we like beer, we don't want it in the environment. So most of the rock that we actually mine or the waste rock does not have the ability to generate acid. And we have procedures for sorting that and putting it in permanent stockpiles, much like you see for the waste rock from taconite mining. The ore, the, the uh, copper nickel that has value, is moved over to the plant site where it's processed. But there's still a little bit of waste rock that could generate this weak acid. The way we've designed our project with that is we take that stockpile of rock and we put it on a liner. And you think of a multi-layer liner of clay and synthetics. So when the rainwater hits it, any water that washes off is collected, treated by a wastewater treatment plant, and or sent over to the plant site. So actually doing mining operations, we are a zero discharge facility for the mine site into the environment. So then what happens, you say, okay, so the mining's done, what happens to that stockpile? The preferred method is we actually backfill that in to one of the mined out pits, the east pit. And when you backfill it in, what happens is that it's treated with lime and the groundwater then fills up that pit again. And what happens is when the water hits the rock, it ends the oxygen. The oxygen doesn't get in and you end up, you don't have the acidification. Through the process of post mining and enclosure, they end up with the west pit or becomes a pit lake. That is pH neutral. Similarly, at the tailings basin, the tails themselves are non-hazardous, pH neutral as well. We're fortunate here with polymet because the rock is, the, it's a low grade sulfur, so the amount of acidity is relatively small relative to other deposits in other parts of the US. But I will say for those other deposits that have been mined or in process, such as the Flambeau mine in Wisconsin, or the Eagle mine in Michigan, which has a higher um, content, they're also doing those safely without acid rock drainage. So right. you basically have a situation here with environmental controls and engineering controls to prevent it, zero discharge mine, and management of that rock. Let's take a, a look at this uh, overview of the mine site at year 11, just to orient ourselves to what you were sure. talking about. Now, which, which area w will you fill in um, with that will become the pit lake? So if you look at this particular map, what you see is several features. First of all, noteworthy in the center is a wastewater treatment plant. So in terms of how you manage it. Secondly, the, the mining starts um, here in the east and the west pits. And when these empty out, this particular stockpile here is on a liner. It's called category 2-3. So this is rock that's not good enough to be ore in terms of to be able to process, but could generate acid unlike all the rock over here. This is the rock that actually gets backfilled. So it's, it's on the liners for a, for a limited amount of time yes. while the mining is going on, and then it eventually goes back into the east pit. Right, and then when it's put back into the east pit, lime is added. We actually reclaim this whole pit as a wetland. 
For those of people that are interested in wetland management, this particular wetland reclamation isn't part of the credits that we get for re restoration. Those are actually elsewhere. So then when the mine ends up closing, we have a situation of no stockpile of rock that could produce acid because it's all backfilled in a wetland. We have a permanent stockpile that's covered that cannot generate acid. And this is very similar to other stockpiles you've seen on the, range, you see on the Iron Range. And then you have a pit um, here called the West Pit, which is, fills up as a lake. And so this is what it ends up looking like. Our project calls for active water treatment um, in terms of to make sure that we meet all water quality standards. Eventually it will discharge into the Partridge River, which is a tributary of the St. Louis River. And for example, you have North Shore Mine, which discharges into that system as well today. Over time, what we'll be doing is moving to passive systems such as wetlands, and we expect probably 30 to 40 years after mining to move to those systems. Very importantly though, regulators are saying that they are gonna hold us to the standard of having this active and to financially assure that treatment for as long as it takes until we move to those passive systems. Now, there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, there was a 200 and 500 year discussion, you know, we're gonna have to actively treat for that long. Help us understand what was really meant by those comments. Sure, let's turn to a different map of the established mining area because I think this one illustrates it best. So when you think about the modeling that's done for water quality, key in that is the modeling was not done to determine how long water treatment would occur. The modeling was done to determine that the water quality would always meet standards. Let's talk about that. So if you look over at this tailings basin here, there was modeling to determine that despite having a hydraulic barrier, or in other words, you know, the basin made not to leak, you still model some leakage, leakage. And the reason for that is you know that no system is perfect. So what the water modeling showed is that if there was some water that wasn't treated and actually moved out of the system towards the compliance points, that it would always meet water quality standards. Well, here's where the 500 years came from. The water here moves so slowly towards the compliance points on the Embarrassed River, it moves, uh, moves a matter of inches a year. It takes 500 years to get to the compliance point. So they modeled for that duration of time to determine that it always met standards. And so that's the key on that aspect. Over at the mine site right here, the issue is that, again, for any water that would move you know, out of the system, that it would take approximately 200 years to get to the Partridge River system. And so the modeling determined that indeed it would always meet those standards. But there's one a other aspect of water quality that's important in terms of to demonstrate to viewers how conservative this is. Consider the water bottle here. Mm -hmm. Let's pretend it's a rock now. So think about this rock and the constituents in there. It has some metal, sulfate, and the different elements that make up a rock. The people that did the water quality modeling assumed that every bit of the constituents in this over time would be released. And so the modeling actually determined what would happen if everything were released. So that means like the rock was smashed into smithereens and everything that was in there was released. Right. Well, we know, for example, if you go to the stockpiles, some of these rocks are a foot, three feet, four feet. And typically what happens when rain hits a rock, you do wash off um, uh, different constituents, but then you form a rind on it. And the central part of this rock actually will never release. Much like if any of you go to the Duluth breakwater or the crushed rock on the sides of Highway 169, or you know, as you travel to Ely, those rocks are gonna be there a long time. So we already know that the modeling in terms of release of constituents, whether it's a tailings basin or whether it's a mine site, are greatly overestimating actually what's gonna be there. And even though it's overestimated, we meet all standards. But there's still another area of defense in terms of, you know, people say, what if your model's wrong? I mean, what if for some reason, besides the conservatism built into the model, we know that because the water moves so slowly, you have monitoring wells. And so you will use those wells to determine if there's any issues that appear to be happening. If they do, you can deal with them literally years and decades before they're a problem. So, so just describe what a monitoring well looks like. Sure, so in the area, for example, around the tailings basin, the, the, from the surface 
through the different um, soils and, and uh, glacial till, it's about maybe um, 20 to 40 feet, so it's very shallow. So you have wells that are bored down into that, that they do regular testing of that water to make sure the consistency hasn't changed. And I think it's important for reason, re, um, listeners to know, we've been testing these wells for years because it's important in order to determine if there's a change, you have to have a really good baseline right. of what's today. So all around the tailings basin, the mine site, we've had years of re monitoring well data and research. It's something to point out about that data, even in terms of what we monitor, how often we monitor. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has signed off on the number of wells, how we're doing it, and they are satisfied that we've got a robust data set with which to move forward as we actually permit this mine. Great. All right. Well, we've, we've had a great conversation so far. We'll going to take a short break and then we'll be back with more right after this. Jobs for Minnesotans, a coalition co-founded by the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council and the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce and strengthened by community leaders and businesses from across the state. Together, we represent 55,000 men and women of the trades, 2,300 businesses and hundreds more mayors, local chambers of commerce and citizens who support job creation through the responsible development of copper nickel mining. Welcome back, I'm Jessica Stauber, joined by Brad Moore, Executive Vice President of Environmental and Governmental Affairs at PolyMet Mining, and we're talking about the company's NorthMet project near Hoyt Lakes. Now, we've been talking a lot about the water treatment at the mine site, but let's move over to the uh, plant site and talk more about the tailings basin. First of all, what are tailings? Sure, so tailings, when you take the rock from the mine site, in our particular case, you rail it over to a series of buildings where it's crushed from two to four square feet into a fine powder. When you crush into the powder, then we use a circuit called flotation that's enclosed where you add different chemicals and you separate the copper, nickel, and the constituents that you use in terms of that we sell from the waste. The waste is a sand-like substance, and that is then moved and pumped out to the tailings basin. So think of a tailings basin, actually if we look at the map right here, um, as a large facility where you store that washed sand. Now it's non-hazardous, has a pH of neutral, and this is very similar to the other tailings basins you see on the Iron Range. In fact, the reason is this was a tailings basin for LTV. So this is really one of the key large reuse projects, really, in northern Minnesota. And now you call this a facility, but I've driven on top of this thing. It just looks like a mound. It's not, it's, it's really blends into the landscape. Well, there's several things is that, first of all, if you go on this side of the particular tailings basin, it's all vegetated and grasses. Uh, there's mining reclamation rules, both for iron mining and non-ferrous, and there's very strict standards as you close these basins in terms of how you do it. In fact, the non-ferrous mining rules, or copper nickel, actually were developed as a part of a collaborative process, not only with industry, but with environmentalists. And I think that's pretty key to point out. But when you, the other thing is that because this particular basin was designed in the 1950s, you know, the environmental standards weren't the same. We had a situation, for example, where some of those sulfates, as I said earlier, actually are leaking through the, you know, this, the basin out towards the, the surficial aquifer. That's the area that, in terms of our project, is going to basically put an end to that legacy issue from the previous operations. And if you look around this map, we basically put that hydraulic barrier, that's bentonite, think of it as a clay curtain, and then you actually pump that water that would move there to the wastewater treatment plant that's situated right here. So, you so what you're doing there is just cleaning up the historical issues. Yes, we are. And one of the areas, for example, we're cleaning up is to meet the wild rice standards. It's so going to be a tremendous there. benefit to this region. It will, and the other thing is it will show how this technology can be used effectively. And as you can see from this map, we're going to be reusing the east side of this basin, so about two square miles. Actually, in the environmental review and scoping process, they looked at alternative sites for Tailings Basin, and they found when you consider this is here, it's already an impacted area, it makes a lot more sense to reuse this facility than to go and design another one somewhere else, impact a green field, et cetera. Let's use the entire life of this and then close it properly, and then, and then at that time you can move on. 
Great. Now, tell us about this other slide. It, it gives some more detail on how the tailings basin works. Sure. So this is a cross section. If you were to cut the tailings basin in half, like a side cut view, first of all, what you notice in the gray is these are the tailings from the taconite operations. So the LTV SMC tailings. Right. Okay. And then the lighter ones right here are from our particular project. I think a really key point to note is that in the development of these lifts, we are going to use taconite tailings. So the structure of this, this basin is going to be very similar to the other taconite facilities and not different. Um, the tailings are, are ours are enclosed in taconite all around it. So this, this maroon line, jagged line, that's the taconite barrier? It's all right here. It's all this gray. This particular line is betonite. And what you're looking at, a picture that the slopes are amended with that clay-like substance so the water runs off instead of going down into the, to be collected by the wastewater treatment plant because why collect rainwater? Right, right. The other couple you know, things that you'll note here is rock buttressing. Early in the development of this base in terms of when we start mining, we're adding that but buttressing for more stability. Some of you may have heard about the Mount Pauli tailings basin breach in British Columbia. A couple of key points on that is there was an area that it was not rock buttressed. That's where it failed. We have bar rock buttressing, bust buttressing throughout ours. In addition, the slopes in terms of that basin at Mount Pauli were much steeper and ours are much shallower, like really about four times as shallow. But more importantly, the work to get a basin up and running for a new project we do many geotechnical borings. We ensure that the, there's the stability is there and the design of the structure is strong. And if you think about it, we've had 130 years of tailings basins in Minnesota without a major failure. We certainly don't want one now, and we are adamant ours won't either. In fact, using the same kind of tails that we have in taconites, rock, rock buttressing, and the kind of what we call geotechnical work, but frankly, it wasn't done for Mount Pauli. So you have a very different situation in terms of design, the research into it, as well as the strict monitoring that the Department of Natural Resources has, what's what's called a dam safety permit. And all these kinds of, uh, are actually common in all tailings basins in northern Minnesota in terms of that monitoring. So we have a situation where we have a basin that's existed for 40 plus years safely. And now as we move forward to reusing it and adding enhancements like this and others, to make sure it's not only safe, but it's even stronger than it was before. And because of the cutoff wall and the water treatment, deal with legacy issues, clean the site up. Wonderful. Now you mentioned when the project is done, the tailings basins will be closed. What does that mean? What does that look like? Sure. So in the tailings basin, uh, uh, when the mining stops, think of tailings that they're wet. And so there's, there's saturated water inside this basin. When you amend the slopes of bentonite, you stop the rainwater from coming through, and the water, or what they call head, starts coming down. The way out of treatment plant treats it, and eventually you, you have very little water in that. We have a permanent pond that's just like a stormwater pond on top, and then it stormwater runoff, and you end up with a very different permit. So that active part of the basin ceases. The other thing under the DNR's reclamation rules is we have financial assurance. We'll get into that in a minute. But financial assurance means that if this basin takes another 30 years to monitor at the close of, of mining, that money has to be in place to make sure any issues that happen at the basin, monitoring, et cetera, take place regardless of whether Polymet owns it, another company, et cetera. Talk a little bit more about the financial assurance. Uh, people want to know that if something happens, Polymet goes away, that the project will be will be closed properly. How do they know what that's going to take? How much money will that take? Sure. So financial assurance is a very key component to our operation and this for this reason. If you look at the history of mining back in the 1890s, 1900s, companies would come in and mine, they'd leave stockpiles of rock that weren't engineered in terms of design and walk away. And then only years later they find out that constituents were being released harming streams or the environment. As a result, the financial assurance rules were developed in America where the mining companies would have to put an upfront deposit of funds to make sure that if something went wrong, there would be money to take care of the problem if the company walked away or went bankrupt. While those worked fairly well, one of the problems is that the financial assurance 
actually was a set amount at the beginning of the operation and didn't change. Problem is, as you know, over time, environmental regulations get tougher and you learn things about an operation you didn't know. As a consequence, Minnesota's financial assurance regulations have that dollar amount updated year after year. So first of all is, if you think about year one of a mining operation, very little stockpile, very little rock, the amount of financial liability there is much lower than in year 15 when you have a large open pit and deeper um, in terms of stockpiles. So the financial assurance in Minnesota then floats with the amount of liability. Now, as we've talked earlier, if you think about that large tailings basin that exists today, that's a bit of liability from legacy that's there today. When we're permitted, we have to have enough money that's put in a financial assurance package so that let's say the company went bankrupt and the state had to take it over. There'd have to be enough money for the state to take over that whole basin, reclaim it until closure. And it's the same for the mine site. So what does financial assurance look like? It can be everything from a line of credit, or excuse me, a letter of credit, to bonds, to trust funds. This will be one of the very um, big items that is discussed when our permit application goes in to the Minnesota DNR. That application will, in, will include our proposed dollar amounts and also the various instruments that would be readily available to the state upon demand, regardless of if our company exists or went bankrupt. And by the way, in terms of the public involvement process, permitting also has public meetings and review and comment. Commissioner Tom Landro from the DNR has said expressly that our proposal for final financial assurance will undergo that, that, uh, that review by the public. So people who might have concerns about the project, when they hear about the financial assurance, does that help alleviate those concerns, knowing there's, you know, in addition to all the strict requirements that go into getting the permit to mine, that if something were to happen, the money is there to, to close the mine? It is, and I think even as important as that is, the other thing to remember is that for a company like ours, you never want to invoke the financial assurance. And in fact, we've got a good example, the Flambeau mine, which was in Wisconsin, they had a large financial assurance package because it was an open pit operation near the Flambeau River. When they mined, it was a very large bond. When the mining ended and the pit was refilled and revegetated, a lot of that bond went back to the company. Now, there's still an amount, amount of money remaining for that long-term monitoring mm -hmm. to make sure it goes well, but it's in our financial interest in the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars to do it right. And if it isn't, the money's there for the state. Great. Well, when this project gets the green light, there's going to be a huge benefit for the Iron Range and really the entire state of Minnesota and beyond. Um, even though the plant is there, we talked about the, is it third of a mile long? The concentrator building. The concentrator yes. building. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Talk about just the construction phase to get the project up and running. Sure. So the project has a number of be benefits. First of all, for the construction of the project, we have a project la labor agreement with the trades. So you're going to have union jobs there putting you know, cleaning out the old plan and building it. Um, we estimate about two million hour, uh, construction hours to put that in place, into, including the plant and also the mine site. So it's about the equivalent of building a twin stadium. So you look at St. Louis County actually doing operations, the University of Minnesota Duluth estimated that's about a $500 million impact. That means in terms of not only our revenues, but think of the suppliers to the mines, the added benefits in terms of groceries and all the ancillary parts that happen when you have a big mine go into operation. So from a financial point of view, it's a big shot in the arm not only for the county, it is for tax revenues and then employment not only in the mining sector but in others as well. Now we know Polymet has invested a lot of time into this project, but along with that has gone in a lot of money. How much has Polymet spent so far? We've spent over $220 million since the inception of the project. And you can think of that money going into different areas. First of all, in terms of the design of, of the mine uh, site and also the processing plant, all the environmental controls that we have so that we protect the land and air and water, and then also the cost of the environmental review. A lot of people don't realize that we pay for the time the Department of Natural Resources uses, the Forest Service, and the, and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to actually review the project. And actually, they do the writing of the environmental impact statement and the permits, they're actually agency documents. 
we pay for all that as well. And that's important to note because as we move forward on the project, um, we should be paying for it. We're the ones with the proposal. We're the ones that need to prove it. But to let people know there's been a great deal of investment. The other thing I'd point out on the investment is, you know, one of the lead engineering companies we're using is Bar. Bar has offices on the Iron Range in Hibbing, offices in Duluth, offices in Minneapolis, Foth Engineering as well in Duluth. The jobs we're providing, they're actually happening now for our project through consulting engineers, men and women that are committed to not only engineering this project properly, but also making sure the regulatory controls are in place and it's done right. The other thing I'd like to point out is if you look at commodity cycles, you know, commodities rise and fall. That's whether it's um, iron, whether it's copper, nickel, or look at housing. So in terms of um, diversification of the iron range economy, the copper commodity cycle is not the same as iron. And one of the benefits of adding this project is that some of those slumps that occur in different commodities, they're smoothed out, and we're able to, again, diversify this economy so it's strong for everyone. And as you know, in terms of the trades and the people that work on the mines, the skill sets are transferable right. to all kinds of mining and operations. So it means a more robust employment environment. Great. All right, we're going to take one more short break, and we'll be back right after this. Jobs for Minnesotans, a coalition co-founded by the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council and the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, and strengthened by community leaders and businesses from across the state. Together, we represent 55,000 men and women of the trades, 2,300 businesses, and hundreds more mayors, local chambers of commerce, and citizens who support job creation through the responsible development of copper nickel mining. Welcome back, I'm Jessica Stauber, joined by Brad Moore, Executive Vice President of Environmental and Governmental Affairs for Polymet Mining. We're talking about the company's planned North Met project near Hoyt Lakes. Now the project will affect approximately 900 acres of wetlands. Tell us why wetlands are so important and why you're required to replace them and, and how you're going to do that. Sure, well wetlands are important in terms of habitat. They're very rich in terms of biological diversity and supporting a wide variety of wildlife, birds and invertebrates. Under Minnesota law and actually federal law, for projects that when to destroy wetlands for another purpose, you actually have to replace those wetlands. And the reason the wetland laws came about is years ago, particularly with the development of Minnesota in the agricultural region, you know, millions and millions of acres of wetlands were removed and without a commensurate um, replacement. For a particular project, we're going to be replacing those uh, acreage with about one and a half to one. And what that means is, will actually replace more wetlands than those that are taking in the development of that open pit. Now, in terms of wetland restoration, a lot of people don't realize that the plans that you have to restore those wetlands, they're in other parts of northern Minnesota, actually have to be approved by regulators as well. So if you think about taking an area that once was a wetland and restoring it to, get, to change it back to wetlands to replace those in the mine, you actually have to do engineering plans. Those engineering plans include how water is going to be re-diverted, moved, planting of native species, and basically to move that wetland into a highly functioning state. So the first thing that people need to know is that when we replace them, all those detailed plans are reviewed by state and federal regulators as well. In addition to that, sometimes wetland replacements don't always work well. As a consequence, you also have financial assurance in those instances as well. There's one other area of wetland replacement that gets attention in a mining project. If you think about the effort to, for example, dewater uh, pits and, and work in that area, sometimes that wetland work can have an indirect impact on wetlands in the surrounding area. That is, the water level can be slightly lower. You could have other effects as well. So our wetland mitigation plans, that is replacement, also considers those indirect impacts, and importantly, the state and federal regulators require us to monitor those other wetlands that are not impacted to make sure there aren't indirect impacts over time. And if there are, you have to replace those as well. Well, the more I learn, the more it seems like they thought of everything. Well, the every detail. Environmental review is supposed to be comprehensive. And if you think this EIS that we're working on, the, you know, it's been many, many years. There are over 55,000 public comments, and some of these comments were hundreds of pages. 
Um, the modeling that's done on the water is upwards of over 10,000 pages for certain runs. So it's very thorough in all aspects of air, water, land. And it has to be for a project like this. The permitting process has been lengthy for people who've been waiting for jobs. Well, in the United States, um, the average time it takes to do environmental review and permitting for a mine is in excess of 10 years. So they're very long projects. And it is because of the thoroughness of review. For example, in the public comment period for our project, we had three meetings, and typically an environmental review of one. And that's because people view it as very important. Then, in looking at those public comments, the Department of Natural Resources and the co-leads, the Forest Service and others, have to make sure they are actually responded to. And in terms of responding to a comment, project changes even come out of that. It just simply takes time to do it well. So tell us what is coming next in the process. Sure. So we're nearing the end stages of the environmental impact statement. And what happens is later this summer, we'll see that uh, document filed in the federal register and also in the state environmental review register. And when the agencies determine that document is adequate in terms of the process used to develop it and that they covered all the issues, they can move into the permitting phase. We will be in the process now, actually PolyMet now, is developing the permit detail. For example, the permit to mine, the financial assurance, air and water. So sometime this summer, those big applications are ready to go into the regulatory agencies. Those various permitting processes will be coordinated among the agencies. And also, there'll be a public input process as well for that. So people can weigh in on financial assurance, wetland mitigation, air quality. And so that process will move into the summer and into the fall and winter of 2015. So you'll see a lot of press related to PolyMed in terms of as these processes get up and running and as the environmental impact statement process concludes. Now, I want to circle back to jobs. You talked a little bit about the construction jobs, 2 million construction hours to get the plant up and running. Once the plant is operational, what type of people will you employ? What type of skills will you need? So if you think of a, any industrial project, we have, we have process engineers, mining engineers, heavy equipment operators. Think of every te technical aspect in terms of mine, two-year degrees and four-year degrees. And what's important about these jobs is, you know, the average mining job is about $68,000 a year. You compare that to some of the services jobs at $15,000 a year or $20,000 a year. It really provides a boost for the economy and diversification. And by the way, we need all those. We need our tourism jobs and our service jobs. But adding that high-paying mining component makes for a ro more robust economy. So our kids going to school, whether it's in the Twin Cities Metro, Duluth, Masabi East, and the Rain Schools, this is going to provide more opportunity. Let's talk a little bit more about what this, what this project means. It's, it means diversification, as you've talked about. It means jobs. What else does it mean? Well, it means economic expansion, I mean, for the range. If you look at, in terms of the opportunity for this Duluth complex, we can be mining for many, many, many decades to come. So you have an expansion. You have um, dealing with legacy issues in a proactive, positive way at the company's expense, as opposed to dealing with the legacy issue at the taxpayer's expense. We get a robust financial assurance and running, moving that forward as well. And again, it's about building that strong, diverse economy in northern Minnesota. We've had a great 130-year history, and we need to expand that for many, many decades to come. And with this vision and all of the work you've done to prove that it can be done safely, you must be experiencing tremendous public support. We've been just, it, the public support's been tremendous. When you look across from Grand Rapids to Ely to Aurora, White Lakes, there's just strong support in the communities. And, and they support in many ways, whether it's the, the signs that let you know we're welcome, to the public comments, to showing up at the meetings in Duluth and the Twin Cities and here on the range. That support has been critical to the success of our project. And as we move forward, first I want to say to all the members of the community, thank you, because without that support, Projects like these don't go through, and it's been just tremendous. And as we move forward, we know that we can count on it. And it, it's, just, it's exciting because when you see what will happen in terms of jobs and the economy here, it's just a really good story for northern Minnesota. And how can people show their support moving forward or learn more about PolyMet? 
you know, there's two main avenues. First of all is gopolymet.com. You can learn about the project from our perspective. But in addition, if you go to the Minnesota DNR, their website contains all the issues relative to public meetings and actually how to submit those comment letters and how to get involved. So that combination, if you're more um, comfortable working with regulators, go to the DNR. With us, go polymet.com. Both good sources. Well, thank you. This hour has flown by. We've learned so much about the project and really appreciate um, you sharing your knowledge. One last question. What makes you so excited about this project? You know, when I was a boy growing up, I remember touring with my father and my grandfather and watching the facilities run with the crushers and the grinders. And I knew that was a really big part of our economy. And to now see there's someone with some gray hair in his <laughs> 50s and see that we're going to move another industry into that so that, you know, four or five years from now, can walk into an operating plant and there's going to be another young woman or boy and see that. That's why I do it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time and your insights. You've been very helpful and informative. And I'd also like to thank the viewers for joining us, and hopefully you've learned a lot as well. Until next time, take care.